Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a rental agent, whose name is Chase, and Brooke, who is looking for accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning. My name is Chase. I'm the duty agent. Good morning, Chase. I'm Brooke Fields, and I'm looking for new accommodation. I'm sure I can help you with that. But let's get some particulars first, Brooke. What did you say your family name is? Fields. Good. Now, how old are you, Brooke? Twenty-six, almost. I'm still twenty-five, but my birthday is next month on the twenty-fourth of September. I see. And how long have you been in Australia? Quite a while now. I came three years ago and spent eighteen months in Melbourne at first. How long have you been in Brisbane? A year. But oh yes, I forgot to say I was in Adelaide for six months. But the weather was too cold in winter, and I didn't like it there. You like it here then? Oh yes, I do. Now, what's your current address? Unit four, five Trade Winds Crescent. But I'm only there for three more weeks. I've given notice already. I'm going to have to move quickly to find you something soon. What's the postcode for Trade Winds Crescent? Five two one seven. Thank you. This unit you're renting now is it one, two, or three bedrooms? Two bedrooms and one bathroom. And are you looking for something similar in a unit or an apartment? Yes, two bedrooms will suit me just fine, but. I often have family or other visitors come to stay, so I'd like an extra bathroom. I can understand that. Look, I've just listed an apartment with two bathrooms that might suit you. Would you like to have a look? Have you got time now? Good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Well, here we are. What do you think? It's nice, but I wonder whether it gets too hot and stuffy in summer without air conditioning. I shouldn't think so. Did you notice the ceiling fans in all the rooms? Yes, but will I be able to have the windows open? There are no insect screens. Ah, well, there's a reason for that. Insects aren't a problem here. You may not get the sea breezes in this area, but there are other benefits. What do you think of the kitchen? Pretty good, really. It might not be very big, but it has a fresh, up-to-date feel and modern appliances. I just love this cute little pantry too. The landlord has recently done all the floors. Do you like the carpet in the bedrooms? Oh yes, I do. A good neutral colour. I especially like the living room. The polished timber floors are lovely. The bathroom tiles aren't new, though, are they? No, but any cracked tiles have been replaced, and they've all been professionally polished. Anyway, I'm glad you like the apartment. I think I know why. The owner is an interior decorator. Oh, that explains it. But there's just one problem, though. What's that? The rent is three hundred dollars a week. That's a bit more than I have been paying. Well, this is a better area than where you've been living, and the apartment is beautifully appointed. Yes, but two hundred and eighty dollars is my budget, really. 
And how am I going to raise four weeks' rent for the bond? That's $1,200. Well, that could be negotiable. I'll talk to the landlord and see how he feels. He might consider taking three weeks instead. By the way, could you sign a long-term lease? No worries. I've just started a new job in the city, so I'll be around for quite a few years, I hope. Well, that's great. Is your salary direct credited to your bank account? Yes, of course. So it won't be a problem to set up the same system for regular rental payments? I suppose. But I paid my last landlord by cheque or sometimes cash. Well, our agency only accepts electronic methods of payment. It's more secure and it keeps the bookwork nice and tidy. Yes, I see. Well, think it over, but you'll have to be quick. A property like this will be snapped up in no time. Oh, one more thing. It's a bit unusual in this day and age where tenants are expected to cover all the utility bills, like power, telephone and internet. But for some reason, the water is bulk billed to the whole apartment block, so the charge for that is included in the rent. Well, that's a bonus, I guess. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a guide talking to a group of visitors to a farm. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Fiddy Working Heritage Farm. This open-air museum gives you the experience of agriculture and rural life in the English countryside at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see a typical farm of that period, and like me, all the staff are dressed in clothes of that time. I must give you some advice and safety tips before we go any further. As it's a working farm, please don't frighten or injure the animals. We have a lot here, and many of them are breeds that are now quite rare. And do stay at a safe distance from the tools. Some of them have sharp points, which can be pretty dangerous, so please don't touch them. We don't want any accidents, do we? The ground is very uneven, and you might slip if you're wearing sandals, so I'm glad to see you're all wearing shoes. We always advise people to do that. Now, children of all ages are very welcome here, and usually even very young children love the ducks and lambs, so do bring them along next time you come. I don't think any of you have brought dogs with you, but in case you have... I'm afraid they'll have to stay in the car park unless they're guide dogs. I'm sure you'll understand that they could cause a lot of problems on a farm. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right. And we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland. And of course, the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops. But our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small, so you can't get lost in it. Now, can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafes on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right, here, just by the new barn, you'll come to the Black Barn, just where the path first bends. Now, I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard, just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right, well, if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a thesis supervisor and a student who is preparing for postgraduate study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Good morning, Archie. I'm glad you came to see me. Good morning, Dr. Newell. I made an appointment as soon as I got your message. I'll get straight to the point, Archie. It's about your research proposal. It's not even set out correctly. I understand that you haven't done the unit on research and academic inquiry yet, but nevertheless... I must admit, Dr. Newell, I was in a bit of a muddle about just how to approach the whole thing. Well, start a new page in your notebook and listen carefully. I'll run through it with you briefly. I'd really appreciate that. Right. Well, for a start, where's your title? 
I don't think we can consider all this rambling at the top of the page. A convincing title. It should be descriptive, but concise. You can even omit the preamble an investigation of. Okay, a clear and compelling title. Well, let's move on to the abstract. Yeah, I'm not really sure I know what that is. It's the aim of your investigation. Yours is only a relatively short dissertation, but you'll still have to include the research question, the rationale for the research, the methods you'll use, and what you expect the main findings to be. But I don't know what I'll find, because I haven't done the research yet. But you must have some idea. Well, yes, but the results could be quite different. That isn't a problem. That's what research is all about. Now, moving on, some people have an introduction, and others just combine it with a literature review. In your case, I'd probably suggest you just go with a literature review. This is where I note down the books and articles that are related to my field of study, right? Well, it's a little more than that. You have to evaluate the relevant literature and be able to show how your research fits into a certain area. So I write down the titles of the published material that has a similar theory to mine. Yes, but you should demonstrate how your theory is different from others as well. That's an awful lot of reading. Precisely. What you have at the moment is woefully inadequate. I guess I need to spend my summer vacation in the library. Yes, that's not a bad idea. But let's move on, shall we? There's more? Yes, your next section should be methodology. I know that means methods, but I'm a bit stuck here. This is your work plan. This is where you summarize your data collection process. Like who will take part? Yes, your participants, how you'll get your samples, and most importantly, how you'll measure your samples. So that unit on validity and reliability will finally come in useful. Yes, but you'll also have to consider how you'll plan to proceed. Got that. Then what? Discussion is the next heading. What do I discuss? Potential outcomes. You must be able to show what significance your findings will have and how you plan to use them. Also, I think I should mention, this is the section where you'll state any limitations or weaknesses that your research might have. Hmm, there might be a few of those. Well, that's it in a nutshell, really. There are more complex templates for research proposals, but I think this is enough considering the length of your dissertation. Oh, one more thing. Don't forget to include any ethical considerations there might be. Depending on what you have in mind for your participants, you may have to get approval from the Ethics Committee. I have to get their written consent, don't I? Yes, but you will also explain how you're going to protect their identity. Oh, fine. I think I can handle that. Thanks very much, Dr. Newell. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 28 to 30. All I've done is go through the key elements with you. Let me explain that the proposal has to convince me that your project is worthwhile and that you have the necessary competence to carry it through. I understand. As you write it, you need to bear in mind three basic questions, and they are, what do you hope to accomplish, why do you want to do it, and how are you going to do it? I can't make it simpler than that. No, no, that's really helpful. Thanks. Just a bit more advice, Archie. Students often come unstuck in their proposals because they don't organize their material. They lack focus and rely too much on repetition. Failure to cite references correctly will also go against you. Is APA style good? We don't specify a style in this department, but whatever you choose, it must be consistent. I'll stick with APA. I know that one. Good. One more thing, Archie. Don't ramble. You have a tendency to write without a clear sense of direction and include too much detail on minor issues. Keep the details for the major issues. I'll make a note of it. Okay. Get the revised proposal in to me by next week, and I'll have another look at it before the break.
That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about conflict at work, given by a business studies lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Over the years, attitudes towards workers have changed considerably. After all, there was a time when workers had no rights at all and laboured in appalling conditions. Conditions have improved a lot, but conflict in the workplace is still common and human resources managers nowadays need to be able to deal with it when necessary. What is conflict in the workplace? Definitions vary, but I'm taking it to refer to a whole range of behaviours that the victim finds unacceptable, from minor, harmless arguments to, at the opposite extreme, physical violence. Much of this is covered by the term bullying, by which I mean one or more people behaving abusively or aggressively against another who is in a weaker position. Although all behaviour like this is a form of conflict, not all conflict can be described in these terms. As with all human behaviour, there are numerous reasons for it, but often it's caused by someone who feels the need to show their superiority over someone else in order to feel that they aren't at the lowest level in a hierarchy or a group of people. In some cases, one person simply dislikes the other on the basis that the personality of one is in some way incompatible with that of the other person. A general habit of optimism in one person could make them intolerant of a colleague who's constantly pessimistic. Not that that justifies treating them badly, of course. Some conflicts arise when people are more interested in promoting themselves and their team than in the company as a whole. These conflicts are called structural and could come about, for example, when a sales team believe they are the only people in the business who do any useful work and look down on behind-the-scenes administrators. Conflict obviously affects the individuals concerned. The situation is likely to be very stressful for victims, resulting in their absence from work possibly for months. For the company, if no effort is made to deal with conflict, it can spiral out of control and even lead to the breakdown of the business. 
Some interesting work with chief executives, CEOs, has uncovered some of the reasons why they may treat colleagues badly. Many CEOs combine two opposing characteristics. Confidence, that is, the belief that they're capable of great achievements, with a high level of anxiety, a fear of missing targets, whether set by themselves or by the directors of the company. This combination can make them respond badly to anyone who questions their decisions. In a high-pressure work environment, such characteristics become problematic, and it's particularly difficult to tackle the situation where colleagues, managers and board members are all trying to achieve their own visions. When they can't agree on strategic issues and on where they see the business going, there are real problems. For managers at lower levels within the organisation, it might seem that an autocratic form of management, where the chief executive gives orders and everyone else has to obey, would see more conflict than others. Interestingly, though, a company with a more democratic business model can suffer more when uncertainty about who to report to leads to conflicting demands. Now I'll say a little about dealing with the type of conflict that has harmful effects. Of course, the ideal is to prevent it arising in the first place. A good manager at any level will make efforts to earn the respect of the people they work with, particularly those who report to them. That will involve politeness in all communications and treating them as equals who happen to have a different role within the organisation. Sometimes, of course, conflict does occur and can get out of hand. In such cases, the Human Resources Department often gets involved. However, if one of the parties in a conflict sees human resources as simply a mouthpiece for the chief executive, then an external mediator might be able to help. By talking to both sides and trying to find the truth of what's been happening, they can build a clear picture of the situation and give feedback that both sides will accept, precisely because they're independent. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Absolutely. Improving your English speaking takes practice, but it can be fun. Here are some tips to get you started. Speak as much as possible. Conversation is key. Find opportunities to talk in English, whether it's with friends, family, a tutor, or even yourself. Embrace mistakes. Don't be afraid to slip up. Everyone makes mistakes, and that's part of learning. Focus on getting your message across and keep practicing. Listen and absorb. 
immerse yourself in English, watch movies and TV shows, listen to music and podcasts, pay attention to how native speakers use the language, expand your vocabulary, read books, articles, and anything else that interests you. This will expose you to new words and phrases. Make it fun learning shouldn't feel like a chore. Find ways to make practicing English enjoyable. Try singing along to English songs, doing tongue twisters, or even thinking in English. Here are some resources that you might find helpful. Conversation exchange apps. Many apps connect you with native English speakers for language exchange. Online courses. There are many online courses available to help you improve your speaking skills. English movies and TV shows. Watching with subtitles in your native language at first can help you associate sounds with words. Remember, the most important thing is to be consistent with your practice. The more you speak English, the more comfortable and confident you will become.